everyone, ladies, <laughs> particular, in particular, all right, but it's a good time for us guys, too, that we can honor our, 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 our mothers and our wives, and, and uh, Jeannie and I have family here, this uh, second row right here is all family, but I do want to particularly say that the queen mother of our family is here, my mother is here, Jimmy Grace, yay. Yeah, and so mom, it's so great to have you here, and uh, I've got great mothers in my family. Of course, my mom's great. My sister's a great mother. Both of our daughters are, are uh, great mothers, and, and Jeannie has always been a great mother, so we have been blessed in our family with great mothers, and so mom, I'm so glad you're here, and we have a lot of guests here too, and so we're glad you're here. Anybody, by the way, uh, my grandmother always introduced all her family on Mother's Day at this small little church in Willow. So does anybody want to introduce uh, their family that, that you would feel slighted? All right. Okay. All right. I'll just say, let, let's just welcome all of our guests this morning. Okay. Let's just do that. All right. Well, every Mother's Day, I always preach on a lady from the Bible. Sometimes they're mothers, sometimes they're not. Sometimes we don't know if they were mothers or not. Uh, Lydia, I'm going to be preaching on Lydia this morning. And so um, I think it's, it's interesting. Uh, she has a very brief story in the Bible, but it's very compelling. It's very compelling. Before we get into that, let me read something to you. It's... Uh, I guess a gentleman was filling out an insurance application uh, or an injury application, uh, filling out a form for his insurance company. He'd been injured, okay, and he had to turn it in. And those are always a lot of fun to fill out, right? All those forms and it's the same like the forms when you go to the doctor, you have to fill out all the forms. But he's writing, uh, he, he, he was injured on the job and he's filing an insurance claim. And he said, dear sirs, I am writing in response to the request concerning clarification of the information I supplied in block 11 on the insurance form, which asked for the cause of my injury. I answered, trying to do the job alone. I trust that the following explanation of my answer will be sufficient. I am a bricklayer by trade. On the date of my injury, I was working alone laying brick around the top of a three-story building. When I finished the job, I had about 500 pounds of bricks left over. Rather than carrying the bricks down by hand, I decided to put them in a barrel and lower them by a pulley that was fastened to the top of the building. I secured the end of the rope at ground level, then went back up to the top of the building, loaded the bricks into the barrel and pushed it over the side. I then went back down to the ground and untied the rope, holding it securely to ensure the slow descent of the barrel. As you will note in block number six of the insurance form, I weigh 145 pounds. At the shock of being jerked off the ground so swiftly by the 500 pounds of bricks in the barrel, I lost my presence of mind and forgot to let go of the rope. Between the second and third floors, I met the barrel. This accounts for the bruises and the lacerations on my upper body. Fortunately, I retained enough presence of mind to maintain my tight hold on the rope and proceeded rapidly up to the side of the building, not stopping until my right hand was jammed in the pulley. That accounts for my broken hand. Despite the pain, I continued to hold light tightly to the rope. Unfortunately, at approximately the same time, the barrel hit the ground and the bottom fell out of the barrel. Devoid of the weight of the bricks, the barrel now weighed about 50 pounds. I again refer to my weight in block six, where my weight is listed. I began a rapid descent. In the vicinity of the second floor, I met the barrel coming up. This explains the injury to my legs and lower body. Slowed only slightly, I continued my descent, landing on the pile of bricks. Fortunately, my back was only sprained. I am sorry to report, however, at this point, I again lost my presence of mind and let go of the rope. This accounts for my other injuries. 
I trust that this answers your concern. Please note that I am finished trying to do the job alone. What's the point? The point is God never intended us to do the job of life alone. He put us in groups and those groups are called families. And you know, when families work together and it, it makes life so much easier, it, it lifts the burdens of lives uh, of life because we can all work together to help one another. But when families don't function in a healthy way, then it hurts people, it hurts families, it hurts even nations. And, and so the heart of every family is the mother. You've heard it said the father is the head of the home, but it's the mother who is really the heart of the home. And I would say this about a mother's love. A mother's love is as tough as steel, but as soft as velvet. And that's it. A mother's love is like that. And so this morning, I just want to, again, say I appreciate all these mothers. I appreciate my mother and all the mothers that have sacrificed so much for their children. And, you know, a lot of that sacrifice was when I was just a child, a little baby. I didn't know all, that I was crying and causing all the trouble that I was, I was causing, you know. And uh, I just hear little stories here and there. But I think I was a lot of trouble growing up, okay. And, and you know, we cannot raise ourselves and so we need mothers, a mother's love, especially when we're little babies and then we're toddlers. Mothers protect us and feed us and clothe us and shelter us. And then when we're older children and then we're, we're preteens, we still need guidance. Even when we're teenagers and then become adults, we still need a mother's love and a mother's uh, uh, hand and guidance in our lives. And so this morning I am going to be preaching on Lydia. Uh, Paul met Lydia in his second missionary journey, and uh, he received a vision to go to Macedonia. And before he received this vision, it's interesting, if you'll read, it says that he was going to go into Asia, but the Holy Spirit prevented him from going to, into Asia. That he was getting ready to go into Bithynia, but the Lord said no. And sometimes, you know, God gives us negative guidance. Negative guidance is when you go, hey, God, this is a great idea. And he goes, no. And you're going, what? Why, why can't I do this? And so sometimes we get frustrated with God, don't we, when he says no. But then it's when we wait and pray. And that's what Paul did. Paul was traveling with Silas and with Luke and with Timothy. And so he waited in Troas saying, Lord, where do we go? And it said, as I, as I just said, that uh, he had a vision in the night of a man from Macedonia calling out saying, Come over and help us. And so even though Lydia has a brief description in the Bible, we're going to pick that apart today and kind of unpack it. And I think you're going to see some interesting things about this woman uh, named Lydia because she was a remarkable woman. Lydia, a remarkable woman of God. Let's read the text this morning. Therefore, sailing from Troas, this is after the vision, the dream, we ran a straight course to Samothrace. And the next day came to Neapolis and from there to Philippi. It was about 10 miles from the port city of Neapolis to Philippi, which is the foremost city of the part of Macedonia, a colony. And we were staying in that city for some days. And on the Sabbath day, we went out of the city to the riverside where the prayer, where prayer was customarily made. And we sat down and spoke to the women who met there. Now, a certain woman named Lydia heard us. She was a seller of purple from the city of Thyatira, who worshipped God. The Lord opened her heart to heed the things spoken by Paul. And when she and her household were baptized, she begged us saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. So she persuaded us. Later on, Paul and Silas are arrested for casting a demon out of a slave girl. And there's a big to-do, and they're in the prison. And you remember the earthquake and all of that, and uh, how the Philippian jailer was going to kill himself. They said, don't kill yourself. Uh, we're, all the prisoners are here. Paul and Silas had been singing at midnight. And so the, this jailer accepted the Lord, and all of his family, his household, was saved and baptized. And then they get released because 
the authorities realized they were Roman citizens. They didn't realize that at first. They thought they were just Jews and they were very scared. And so they released them. And especially after the earthquake, they're going, hmm, we better let these guys go. And the officers told these words to the magistrates and they were afraid when they heard that they were Romans. Then they came and pleaded with them and brought them out and asked them to depart from the city. So they went out of the prison and entered the house of Lydia. And when they had seen the brethren, they encouraged them and departed. Join me in a word of prayer. Father God, we just ask that your blessing would be upon the service, that you would help me to preach as I should, that you would touch the hearts of everyone here. And especially, Lord, those ladies that are here in person, those that are watching on social media. And Lord, if there's anyone here this morning that does not know you as their personal Lord and Savior, I pray that they would give their heart to you today. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We know Lydia, number one, through her livelihood. Okay? Livelihood. Lydia made her living as a seller of purple. And you know what's so great about the internet today? You can Google stuff. You can Google all kinds of stuff. And I found out something about this. This was a very unique occupation, and it took a great deal of patience and expertise. This purple dye was produced by spiny ocean snails called the murex. In fact, we might have a picture. There we go. These are the little, the little uh, snails, marine snails, ocean snails that they had to take apart. They had to crush them and take out the little secretion glands that were in them. You can see that the two, two top are called murex. And this is, this is in German, okay, but anyway. But it's, those are murex. And then the other one is a rock shell. And so it was something that was very difficult. You had to send out people, divers, to go get the shells. And then you had to break them apart. And I'm going to tell you some pretty amazing things about this in just a second. It was, you know why it was so expensive? Because it took 12,000 snails to make 1.4 grams of dye. 12,000, yes, 1.4 grams of dye. And there are 454 grams in a pound, okay? So today, a few ancient craftsmen still do this. And one gram of Tyrian dye today, you can buy it, it's $2,700. I saw that on the internet. And the glands from these snails had to be extracted and boiled for 7 to 10 days until the water turned crimson or purple. And today, a pound of Tyrian dye... Just a pound would cost at least $1,200,000. A pound of hamburger meat, a pound of Tyrian dye. Uh, during the first century, only the very, very rich could afford it. And the most expensive fabric of that day was called the Debathos material. And it meant that it was fabric that was twice dipped in this dye. So you can see that only the very very rich could afford this because it was such a tedious process and it took so much labor to to get this purple dye and therefore we know that Lydia was probably a woman of means we know that she invited the missionary team of these four men to stay at her house and so she probably had servants she had a large house where she had the bedrooms and and the means to feed them and take care of them and we know that uh, her, her, her clientele definitely had to be upper class. Philippi was one of the richest uh, towns in that province. And it was named after Philip II of Macedon, uh, who was the father of Alexander the Great. We can also safely assume that she probably was unmarried at this time. This is why, as we looked at our text, and I don't know if I'll go back over that text, but it says... If she had been married to not, uh, her hu a husband was never mentioned by Luke. And had she been married, that would have been very unusual and rare at that time. Because usually women were identified with her husband. So no husband is named by Luke. Number two, she said, come to my house and stay. Had she been married, she probably would have said, I will go talk to my husband or come to our house and stay. So we're getting clues here. 
also, it said they entered the house of Lydia. And so it would seem that she was the home owner of that house. And then finally, it said that she persuaded us. There sem seemed to be, with Paul and his missionary group, there might have been a slight hesitancy to, to stay there with her. And that is consistent with the fact that she probably was not married. Now, the other question is, had she been married before? Well, probably, probably. Um, you know, back then, you didn't really decide, ladies, and even guys, whether you were going to get married or not. Even when you were a preteen, your marriage was arranged by your parents. And they decided who you were going to marry and, you know, and all of that. And you were told that when you were probably 11 or 12 years old. And then women married very young back then, 13, 14, 15. The guys a little older than that. So she probably had been married. We can't say it for certain. But theologian and, and a lady that wrote all the women of the Bible, Edith Dean, says it's easy to suppose that she was a widow. That she had probably uh, been widowed. And now she started her own business to support her family. Because again, a, a woman that ran her own business at that time was a little uh, odd too. But if she didn't have a husband, then she had to, uh, she had to do that. She had to have her own uh, business to support her family. And uh, she was from Thyatira and they specialized, they've even found in archeology span that they had a dyer's guild over there. And so she had learned that trade probably when she was growing up and then brought it to Philippi to support her family. So we can probably also say that she had children, that her household consisted of children and her servants and workers and their children. Let me say this. If you have your own business and you have a household and you have children to take care of, you are a very, very busy woman, right? And I, I want to just say, you ladies are very busy because you not only carry the responsibilities and the chores, there's chores of home, there's chores of meals. Some of you ladies are just tired of cooking. I know that. Some of you are like, I'm tired of making up menus. I don't know what we're going to eat. Uh, let's go uh, to the drive through okay? Um, something like that. But... Uh, I know that she must have at times, as she grew in her faith, as she grew in her faith in the Lord, I'm sure that she learned to cast her burden upon the Lord. In fact, there's just a few scriptures here, ladies. I know, I just feel for you, you, you in some ways carry things more closely to your heart than men do. I, I would just admit that. Sometimes we are a little unfeeling. Men are a little clueless sometimes. And you ladies carry those uh, burdens in your heart for your family. Psalm uh, 56, 3 says, whenever I am afraid, I will trust in you. I bet Lydia knew that scripture. And there's times when we're afraid. We're the adults in the situation, but we still feel like, I don't know how this is going to work out. I'm just going to trust in you. 1 Peter 5, 7 tells us this, casting all your care on him because uh, for he cares for you. For he cares for you. And that means all of your cares. We have to cast sometimes all of our cares or we're just going to fall apart. We need to say, Lord, I cannot handle this. I cannot handle this burden. And I know that we pray for our children and we put them in God's hands. John 16, talks about a peace. These things I have spoken to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Jesus said in this world, we have trouble. Look at the news. <laughs> look at, look at uh, all the things that are going on in this world. You know, I just have to say, Lord, give me your peace. Because if I looked at everything and I didn't know that he was in control, I just think I'd have a nervous breakdown. I would. I mean, just, it's like, I can't handle this. When Cole was little, my grandson, I used to teach him to do this. I'd go, go, go like that and that's how we get sometimes in our hearts and sometimes we just have to slow down and cast our burden upon the lord and say lord give me that peace so we know her through her livelihood a very unusual livelihood but god used that to supply the needs of the church there also there was a yearning in her heart lydia had a yearning for the things of god and the truth about god if we go to the original 
scripture there, go back to the first part of our original scripture, we say that she met, it said, um, verse 13, and on the Sabbath day, we went out of the city to the riverside where prayer was customarily made, and we sat down and spoke to the women who met there. Paul's uh, pattern was always to go first to the Jews, to the synagogue. So I think we can safely assume there was no synagogue there. The Jews required that there had to be at least 10 righteous, godly men in a city to form a synagogue. And so there was no synagogue there. Some people wonder where they got the 10. It's because they said that, uh, some people say that because God told Abraham that he would spare Sodom if he could find just 10 righteous men. So I think we can safely assume there was no synagogue. He didn't go to the synagogue. But Jewish law allowed women to meet and pray. And so Lydia was a, uh, uh, she worshiped God. She was a God-fearer. And these were probably Jewish women who met there by this river. In fact, I do have a picture, I believe, of that river. It's called the Angista River. It's a small river that runs uh, runs through uh, Philippi today. So you can see that small river. So they were somewhere on the bank of that river, gathered together. Paul had probably inquired, where do some of the Jews, a few of the Jews meet? And they said, well, there's some Jewish women that meet there. And Lydia was one of those that met there. And she had a yearning for the things of God. She was a truth seeker. It reminded me a little bit in John 4, 23, 26, when Jesus was speaking to the, the woman at the well. Uh, but the hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. You know, we have to worship God in spirit and truth. There's a lot of people that say, I have my own beliefs. I have my own religious beliefs and concepts. And I believe there is a God. That's not enough. You need to believe in the one who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And so th they believed in a God. They were God fearers. They were God worshipers. Lydia was, but... Paul knew that wasn't enough. He said, oh, you believe in kind of a God. I'll just kind of leave you alone and I'll go on down the road. No, he said, you need to be saved. You need in, to believe in the Savior of the world, the Messiah who came and died on the cross at Calvary. And I'm sure when they met the women, Paul probably gave them the background of how he used to persecute the, the Christians. And he was a righteous Jew and how God revealed himself uh, to him on the road to Damascus. And so, uh, you know, he, he, all of those things. And he says, uh, when he comes, he will, t uh, let's see, verse 25. And the woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. And Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. Some people say, well, Jesus never said he was the Messiah. Yes, he did. Yes, he did right there. Jesus said, she said, uh, well, Messiah is coming. And he said, I who speak to you am he. I'm the one. And so, you know what gets me today, and again, probably gets you too. There's a lot of people just living their lives without concern of what is spiritual truth. What is spiritual truth? And Jesus said something very interesting. He said, if any man wills to do God's will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God, the doctrine that I teach, or whether I speak of myself. He said, if you follow what I say, you will know that I speak of the doctrine of God, of the doctrine of God. I was just walking in the park of, of the other day, and I have a friend, and he's a Muslim friend. And we go back and forth, and he talks to me about Allah, and I talk to him about Jesus. And I told him, I said, well, one thing we can be for sure, uh, sure of is that one of us is wrong. Okay? And I know I'm not wrong. I know what God's done in my life. I have many immutable, incredible proofs of the reality of God and all the things that he's done in my life. And I pray for that man every day. The only way that he can receive really the Lord is, is for the Lord to open his, his heart, to open his heart. Je we know, I, I've already said, uh, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. John 1, 17, 
Well, it says, for the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. So the grace of God came through Jesus Christ through the cross, and the truth of God comes to us through Jesus Christ. He is God the Son and the Son of God. 8, 31 and 32, and John says this, Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth. And the truth shall make you free. Hallelujah. We become free from the burden of, and the penalty of sin. We, get, we, we, we become free from the power of sin. Before we know Jesus, we're controlled by the power of sin. And one of these days when we're in God's presence and in, in heaven, we'll be freed from the very presence of sin. Hallelujah. And then it says that God opened her heart and she made a decision. We know her through her decision. Lydia's heart was open to the gospel. There was a supernatural presence of God that spoke to her when Paul was speaking. It spoke to her in her heart and she knew by the Holy Spirit that God was drawing her and she received Christ. Can people believe in Christ, accept Christ the first time they hear about him? Absolutely. I was in India once preaching uh, with a group that we were in India and this, this young man, the very first time that he ever heard about Jesus, he gave his heart to Jesus because the Lord had opened his heart. And he told me what, the, what the, the God had done to him, how God had given him a dream the night before. And you know what God said to him the night before we got there to that village? He said, God said, there are people coming to your village today to tell you the truth. He was a Hindu. Later that day, he was a follower of Jesus Christ. Isn't that interesting? They're coming to tell you the truth. And those of you that have been here, I've shared that before, uh, that are of the church, but guess that is really a cool thing that God did. So Lydia's heart was open and she made a decision to follow Jesus. No, none of us, unless God had opened our hearts, would, would be followers of Jesus. I remember when I was six years old, God spoke to me, I don't know. And then later on when I was 13, I gave my life to the, life to the Lord. And mom, I thank you for that. She got us involved in church. We were little hooligans running around on Sunday for a while. And mom said, we need to get those kids in church, all right? And as we got to church, we went to the First Baptist Church of Oklahoma City. And I was saved there in November. And sister, you were saved about two weeks after I was. Huh? When I got baptized. Yes. She was saved on the Sunday I got baptized. Uh, and so... Uh, Thank you, Mom, because I heard the gospel. Herschel H. Hobbs preached the gospel. He talked about heaven. He talked about hell. And I felt it was just like this invisible thing pulling me. That was the grace of God. Many of you that were saved, you remember when God was just pulling you. And, and I remember Herschel H. Hobbs said, if you feel that want to in your heart, that's God drawing you to himself. And I felt that. I, I had that want to, but I was embarrassed. And I felt that want to, and I... Just hated to let go. And then finally, I'll just let go. I think he said, take that first step and the rest will be easy. Just take that first step. And it was just that first step. And I walked down to the front. I was crying like a baby because God had opened my heart. And I finally was saying yes to the Lord. The Bible tells us that God must draw us just like he draw, li, drew Lydia to himself. John 6, 44 and 45. Jesus said, no one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws him. And I will raise him up at the last day. It is written in the prophets and they shall be taught by God. Therefore, everyone who has heard and learned from the fathers comes to me. Those that truly knew the father came to Jesus. The religious leaders and the Pharisees and the scribes that rejected Jesus. They didn't even know the father. Because he said, if you knew the father, you would come to me. But he said, no one can come to me unless uh, uh, the Father draws him to me. The Father draws to me. And so I know that this was a, God opened her heart, but she still had to step through that door. She still had to make a decision to follow Jesus. And I knew, I can just imagine that when she was making that decision, all kind of thoughts were flying through her head. Like, what's this going to do to my business? What are my friends going to say? Uh, what's the community going to say? What's my family going to say? And when I hear people sometimes, the reason they don't come to Jesus because I don't want to do this and I don't want to do that. Listen, when you come to Jesus, you truly come to Jesus, you give him everything. You have to give him everything. 
Luke 4, uh, 14, 33 says, so likewise, whoever of you does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. You have to just say, here's my life. It's a blank paper. Jesus, I'm going to follow you. And you know what he says to me? Just trust me. Just trust me. I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. So many people are running around out in the world, women, mothers, guys, all kinds of people looking for love, looking for meaning in their life. And if they would only look to Jesus, they would find that love, that acceptance that they've been looking for. And as Blaise Pascal said, within every person, there is a, uh, uh, a God-shaped vacuum. Only God can fill. You can't fill it up with anything else. You were created to have an eternal relationship with God. And so she was also taking a risk. She was a woman of courage. She was taking a risk by giving the missionary team, Paul, Silas, Timothy, and Luke, a base from which they could evangelize. And before Paul cast out this demon that was in this, this uh, the fortune-telling demon, uh, really, I, I, they can't tell really the future. But anyway... Uh, they do know things. They're a familiar spirit. Before he cast that out, it says he was there. Uh, she followed Paul and Silas many days, many days, saying these are men are from God and they're teaching us how to be saved. It is interesting that the demons, when they came in contact with true disciples or Jesus, that they didn't lie. Isn't that interesting? Like these guys are all fakes and frauds. It's, it's not that. It's, it's, it's that when she was following them it says this girl followed paul and us and cried out saying these men are the servants of the most high god who proclaim to us the way of salvation that's what a demon was saying it's very isn't it have you ever thought of that it's interesting that the demons when jesus said don't tell be quiet because they would say that he is the son of god uh anyway Y'all are looking at me funny. Have y'all ever, I think that's interesting that the demons, when they came in contact with a true disciple or Jesus, they didn't go, oh, these guys are frauds. They're like, these are men of God. This is the son of God. Very interesting. And so, uh, anyway, she put her God first and her family, I'm sure, second. And, you know, that's it. When you put God first, everything else is going to fall in place. The job description of every parent, the job description of every mother is this. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all of these things shall be added to you. I know that I've had people say, well, I, I, I can't come to church because I spend my time with my family on that day. You can take them to church and then spend time with your family that day. All right. Don't put your family. If you put your family before God, then everything, everyone's going to go down with the ship. But if you put God first, God will make sure that your family is well taken care of. That's the way that it should be. Also, we know her through her influence. Through her influence. She was influential in leading her household to faith. We don't know exactly how that went. The, this river was about a mile and a half from downtown Philippi. And so probably when she was saved, she probably wasn't baptized. She said, Go get my family. She probably had some servants there or something. Run back to the house. Get my family. Get my household and bring them all out here. Because it says when we go back to the original text in verses 11 through 15, when we go back to that, it says uh, the Lord opened her heart to heed the things spoken by Paul. And when she and her household were baptized, okay, a lot of little details left out there. She begged us saying, you know, stay with us. So she probably went back and she was probably, you know, touched by the hand of God. She was glowing with the spirit of God. Get my family. God opened their hearts and she, uh, anyway, she, she told them and, and, the, and, and they, were, they were saved also when they heard Paul. Paul went and said the same things to them that he said to her. I just want to say simply, and you ladies, maybe you don't realize it, but you have a lot of influence. Moms, grandmothers, aunts, you have a lot of influence uh, over your family, more than you realize. You have a lot of influence over your children, your grandchildren, your nieces and nephews. Let me just read you a few quotes here. Dr. G. Campbell Morgan was a great preacher. 
he had four sons, and all of those sons were preachers. And so one day, uh, they were at a family reunion, and someone asked uh, this son, he said, which Morgan is the greatest preacher? He looked at his brothers, looked at his dad, and then he said, mother. <laughs> she must have been a great woman of God. She helped those boys get into the ministry. She helped her, her, her husband to be the pastor that he was supposed to be. Abraham Lincoln said, all that I am or hope to be, I owe to my angel mother. Susan Gale, an author, said, mothers are like glue. Even when you can't see them, they're still holding the family together. That's true. That's true. It's not like, well, what would mom think? Or et cetera, et cetera. Stevie Wonder said, mama was my greatest teacher. You know, kids have teachers in school, but mom, you're the greatest teacher. A teacher of compassion, love, and fearlessness. C.S. Lewis said, children are not a distraction from more important work. They are the most important work. And finally, Andy Stanley said this, your greatest contribution to the kingdom of God might not be something you, you do. It might be someone you raise. Think about that. Many mothers and fathers have raised children, sons and daughters, not realizing that they would influence the world in a great way for Jesus Christ. And so, just think of that. Think of that. She had a great influence uh, upon her household. Ladies, you have a great influence upon your family, friends, and peers. And finally, we know her by affection. By her, we know her through her affection. She had a great affection for the spiritual welfare of others and started the first house church in Europe. Turkey is in Asia. Greece, where Philippi was, present-day Greece, that's where Macedonia was. It's in Europe. So she was the first, if you have her have trivia, she was the first European convert. And she had the first house church uh, in her home. Because when they were released from prison, they entered her house. And they'd been there for many days. And so the believers began to gather there at her house. And I'm sure that when they were in prison, that prayer was being made in Lydia's house for Paul and Silas. When they were uh, locked up in the inner chambers, just like prayer was made at John Mark Mother's house when Peter was in prison. And don't you know they were so overjoyed when they heard a knock at the door and there was Paul and Silas. And the lights burned brightly that night and all the brethren gathered as they heard Paul and Silas talk about how God had freed them through the earthquake and the Philippian jail when they were singing praises to God. And I'm sure that they were just so excited about uh, uh, hearing that testimony that the jailer was saved and that his household was saved. And so uh, she showed great affection for the people of God. And so we know her, we know Lydia through her livelihood, her yearning for God, her decision to follow Christ, her influence over her household and others, and her affection for the people of God. And I'm sure she was joyed when she read the letter that the, the Philippians, when she read Philippians, the letter that Paul sent back uh, w when he was imprisoned in, in Rome. Uh, in fact, here's just a few verses. You can just imagine Lydia's heart as she read that letter that he wrote back to the church there. We have Philippians 1, 3 through 6. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, making requests for you with all with joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day. The first day I met you, Lydia, and those, and those believed, I, re, I just rejoice over you guys until now. Being confident of confident of this very thing that he who has begun a good work in you Lydia and others will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ God has a work for every one of us he has something each one of us should do and we just need to stay with the Lord walk with the Lord and then finally I think I'll I'll go to 3 13 through 14 I think I'll do that and and we say this I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me Maybe Lydia said, I needed that today. 
as she read that letter to the church at Philippi. Nevertheless, you have done well that you have shared in my distress. We know that no church shared with Paul like the church at Philippi did. No church. And I'm sure that Lydia was part of that with her business, with the wealth that she had. They sent gifts to Paul time and time again. And so let me just try to wrap up this. Uh, the godly women that we read about in the Bible, you know, they were not esteemed because of their physical beauty, even though the Bible says that many of them, several of them were beautiful. They're not esteemed for the fact that they married well or possessed uh, great wealth or a great talent or had great social standing. They were esteemed because they were women of courage and faith. And they walked with God and trusted God in all the struggles of life. Life is a struggle. But these women were esteemed because they walked with God and they had courage. And they had faith. And they had compassion. So never give that up, ladies. Walk with God. Guys, we need to be the same way and encourage, encouraging our family members to trust God. To be of good courage. And these faithful women not only affected their families at that time and their peers, but they also still influenced us today, as we just read about Lydia. And there is no one more lovely. There is no one more virtuous. There is no one more compelling. There is no one more needed in our world today than a woman of God and a godly mother. That's why we have so many problems today in our society, in America. There's, there's not enough godly women raising their children. There's not enough godly families, husbands and wives raising their children in the fear of the Lord. I'm preaching to the choir today, all right? But how many people out there should be in church today? How many people need to be bringing their children to Sunday school? As I said, when I was small at New Hope Baptist Church, in Tecumseh, Oklahoma, and I just said this the other day, but they told me when I was a little bitty boy, five or six, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your mother and father. And I was taught that. I was taught to honor them because God said I should honor them. I was taught that I should obey them because God said that I should obey them. All right. If you want to write a letter to mom, as one guy did, it's very short. But ladies, this goes out to you also. Dear mom, as I walk through my museum of memories, I owe you for your time day and night. I owe you for your example, consistent and dependable. I owe you for your support stimulating and challenging. I owe you for your humor, sparky and quick. I owe you for your humility, genuine and gracious. I owe you for your hospitality, smiling and warm. I owe you for your sacrifices, numerous and quickly forgotten. I owe you for your faith that was solid and sure. I owe you for your hope, ceaseless and indestructible. And finally, I owe you for your love, devoted and deep. That's a mom. She has a love that's devoted and deep. And she sacrifices and doesn't think anything about it. She gives. She supports. She does whatever she has to do. Because she has a love that comes from her heart deep within and when we know God, that love is even greater. There's a motherly love that is not empowered by the Holy Spirit. But when you see a godly mother, her love is just so incredible. It's just so incredible. And it's a, it's a love that comes from God and is, that is channeled through her to, to you. To you. All right, if you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, if you don't know Him, it's the most important decision you can ever make. We always have an invitation. 
And, and Lydia, one of these days, Lydia is going to be in heaven. You can walk up to Lydia and talk to her and ask her about making purple garments. All right. You can ask her about that. You know how she got there? She got there by trusting in Jesus as her personal savior. That's the first step that you can do to know God is to trust in Jesus Christ as your personal savior. Jesus died on the cross for your sins and he gives you his righteousness when we trust in him. Your name is written in the Lamb's book of life and you become a new creation. If you don't know him today, you can say this simple prayer. If you're watching on so social media, just say this simple prayer. If you feel God drawing you, say this simple prayer. Just say, dear Lord Jesus, I now receive you as my Lord and Savior. Please come into my life and forgive me of my sins. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. Thank you for giving me eternal life. Help me to know you better every day and to, and to fulfill my divine destiny in you. In your name I pray, Jesus. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, you're not here this morning on social media, let us know. Call the church. We'd love to rejoice with you. If you're here this morning, come down front. Say, I prayed that prayer. Or if you need to come down, if you have another concern, you just want prayer. If you want to rededicate your life or whatever you want to do, you come. Will you do that? Would you please stand as we have our invitation? If God's speaking to you, don't delay. You come. You come right now. So are you weary and troubled? No light in the darkness you see. There's light for a look at the Savior and life for abundance and free. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and y'all be seated and remember if you ever have something you need to talk about and, and or you just want to talk about your salvation you come and talk to me i'm always available all right now ladies hal is going to explain he's going to say a few things but we have a rose for every lady here this morning all the mothers and ladies and so we're going to tell you how to get that rose this morning before you leave and we're not going to have service tonight by the way all right god bless thank you for attending thank you for attending if you are a visitor today for the very first time in the seats in front of you, you'll find these small blue cards. There are some of you I don't recognize, so you might be visitors. Please drop this in that offering plate back there in the back, and we'll have a record of your attendance. Um, let's go through the bulletin real quickly. Uh, like Brother Ben said, no service tonight. And it's really cool that Jimmy Grace is here, because if Brother Ben does something today and smarts off, you can tell us the story later. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's see. So no service tonight, uh, May 10th, which is two days from now. We're doing the Living Longer and Loving It from 10 o'clock to noon. And then next Sunday, we're going to have a staff meeting. There are other things later on in the, in the month as well. Two Wednesdays from now, we can't really say winner, winner, chicken dinner, but we can say wish, wish, let's have fish. We're going to have our Wednesday night meal, and it's going to be fried fish again. We just, we had the, the amazing meal a couple of weeks ago. We didn't get enough. So Myra is going to uh, prepare some fish for us using some Louisiana stir fry, and it's going to add some kick. Uh, we're going to cook it down here in the big pots down there. So if you don't normally come to the Wednesday night meal two weeks from Wednesday, make sure she or Norman know so we cook enough fish for you. Uh, it's going to be a great time. Let's see. Um, special thanks to Jan and Dan Lack for the roses to honor our mothers. So he, he, real simple how it's going to go. Jan, thank you. Dan, thank you guys. Um, Josh and Mr. Eric, can I get you? Are going to stand at the back of the, the two doorways. Each one will have a, a bucket of roses. So each mom as you leave, each woman as you leave, you are welcome to grab a rose as you go. 
And then if there, if you want more than one, uh, Jan might have some extras, so talk to her before you grab a handful and try to make it out the door, because we will tackle you. <laughs> uh, let's see. Um, your favorite hymn and song. We're still doing that in the in the bucket in the bucket back there in the hallway. If you have some, uh, put your song back in there, Miss Donna. That was a great song you sang this morning. For those of you that don't know her, Vicky told me that they used to sing in choir when she was in high school. That's been a few years, and uh, she wanted to break back into her singing career. And you did a great job. Great job. Thank you very much for that. Yeah, first time you've sang. How long has it been since you sang? Okay, more than a couple of years. That's, we'll leave it at that. Okay. All right, so we have one memory verse that we should know it by now. Why is today going to be a great day? I didn't see that one up there because that one's dark. So, all right, we're good. All right, so are there any other announcements before I pray us out of here? Anything else? You guys, join me in prayer. Please stand. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for what you do for us. Father, we thank you for the example of Lydia, of the example of Ruth and Esther. Father, we thank you for Moses' wife, Sarah. Father, we thank you for the amazing women of this church who, even though their kids are grown and they may already be with you in heaven, they still give us those motherly qualities that, that remind us that we are a family. Father, we pray that you will bless each one of us as we leave today. May we bring honor to those around us, to our moms, if we're going to celebrate. May we keep our eyes focused on you. And until we come back, may you hold us safe in the palm of your hands. It is in your holy and great name, Jesus, that we all pray. Amen. If you prayed that prayer this morning to accept the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, then please contact us here. Uh, at Two Lakes Baptist Church so we can pray for you and so we can uh, maybe send you some information to help you grow in your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And our contact information is on the screen. You can call us, you can write us, uh, you can email us, or if you would like to become a media member or donate to our church, you can go to our website at twolakesbaptist.church. And you can find more out, uh, information out about our church. And uh, we just want to be in contact with you. We want you to know that we care for you and love you. So until next time, may God bless you and keep you and give you peace.